Professor Van Inwagen, did I detect your hand up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> can't ask him. You can't ask so, a metaphysician uh, a question. My question is on exactly the same passage as Ed's uh, question, uh, which uh, they were not uh, mindless, et cetera. They could see uh, the tensions and contradictions. Oh, did I, say, did I say contradictions? Uh, yes. Oh, I or real. Tensions and oh, contradictions. Oh, there we, there we go. OK. <laughs> yes. There we go. Uh, um, but um, look, in the, in the prose edda, the god Thor makes a trip to Jotunheim, the land of the giants. He spends one night in a castle and sleeps in a room in the castle, which turns out to have been the thumb from a discarded, uh, the club of a discarded giant club. Then later on in Jotunheim, he wrestles with a giant. You can't both, you can't wrestle with somebody in who, the thumb of whose club you could uh, sleep. Well, did that bother the authors or readers of the, or hearers of the prose edda not a bit? You know, they just didn't care about contradiction the way even Herodotus uh, would have cared uh, about contradiction. Is it possible that although in principle if they, they hung on it, if it was a business contract, say the author of Joshua could have, was capable of detecting contradictions, neither the author nor his probable audience would have really cared about whether there were these visible, uh, straightforward contradictions in the work. Well. Peter, I, I suppose when we're telling stories about giants and the like, uh, consistency is not a prime consideration. This is about, they're, they're telling this about human beings, about their fellow Israelites and so forth. So, um, I mean, in principle you can be right, but I think if we take Joshua literally, then the contradictions are, between Joshua and Judges are extremely flamboyant. Now, it's possible that they said, who cares? But over and over and over, up about 15 times, according to my count, they slew all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword. I mean, this is hammered home with emphasis. This is not a one-time reference to the, the giant's glove and so forth. And then it says, but he did not conquer all the land. And then Joshua, uh, Judges <laughs> emphasizes that point. I read five of the cities territories that had not been conquered, and there are three more. I would think that in this case, the, the, the conflict is too flamboyant for even these primitive readers to live with it. But as I said, when you've, read, when you've read for the 15th time and they slew all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword, I think it's impossible not to raise the question. This is formulaic language. We wiped him out last night. I have a couple of quick comments um, that go in different directions. I love this paper. It was really showed a kind of sensitivity to the text and letting it speak to you that I f find very congenial. Um, I like Ed's thought. Um, if I, I don't know if I'll get it right, um, but I liked it. <laughs> that, um, I don't know, it was good. Um, Louise right, helpfully points out that this as a part of a project to rescue the text from attributing immorality to God is a tremendously uphill <coughs> business. That is, even if it's successful here, it's a, it's a big project and it seems impossible given all the things we've heard about and seen and read. Um, the other thought I had was Louise, I'm shocked, shocked that you're more orthodox than he is, <laughs> right? Because you want every message to be a moral message. And he's saying, um, my God, didn't, didn't blacks in the South take comfort from Joshua fit the battle of Je Jericho? Aren't there lots of ways in which a text can provide positive value? Even if, you know, no question that it's dangerous. Yeah. Right. I wonder if you think mein, mein Kampf has some positive value because I'm sure it had, I'm sure there were some edifying um, feelings that were legitimately, I mean, that it was legitimate to have. Um, that 
among people who read that text. Yeah. <laughs> Your next stop is with Professor Draper. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was a, a great paper. Uh, in fact, I liked it so much, I, I want more. Um, <laughs> and here, so here's the more I want. You, know, you mentioned the sequence of books that goes from Deuteronomy to Samuel. And you talked about all of them except for Samuel. And so I'm wondering, uh, without asking you to you know, give another paper right now, um, if you can say a little bit about it. I mean, I noticed that like in in the story of the Amalekites, which I talked about a bit last night, and there, you, know, you don't have that formulaic expression at the beginning. And then the whole point, of course, is Samuel says to Saul, no, you know, you, know, you spared the king <laughs> of, of Amalek. Uh, don't be so non-literal minded, right? When I told you to kill every single last one, I wanted you to kill. Don't be so literal minded. No, I said, uh, no, don't be so non-literal minded <laughs> okay. in the sense that he was supposed to take me literally when I told I you see, to see, exterminate <laughs> the Amalekites. Um, although there is the similarity with Joshua about later on, you know, it turns out the Amalekites, there seemed to be a lot of them left, right? So it, at least give us a hint anyways of what you make of Samuel. Um, yeah, that's a fair question, Paul. Um, and it's, it's, it's by no means my claim that what I call this, this way of interpreting Joshua, the strategy for interpreting Joshua is going to deal with all the sorts of passages that we've been uh, chewing over here. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't. Uh, part of what I'd say is what Prof Professor Swinburne said this morning as a way of interpreting. But I, but I do think you've got similar things with the Amalekites. I mean, here they still exist after they've all, almost all been slaughtered and so forth. What is it, the sheep were not? How does it go? The livestock, but all the human beings were apparently. But there, but there they, there they are. And I don't assume that the editors. I, I'm willing to say that uh, they were confronted with contradictory narratives, but I don't think that they were mindless when they put these together. I, th I think they simply challenge us to be not be so literal-minded uh, in reading these things. Use your imagination a little bit. Allow them to speak loosely sometimes. Is that forbidden to a biblical writer? Grant that they use figures, that they're far more comfortable in using figurative language than we analytic philosophers are. Vastly more. So, I, but I don't propose that that's going to solve every problem in Samuel and Kings. No. So, want to, can I just? Sure. I mean, I would like to write that next paper. <laughs> I just want to mention something that I really appreciated in Nick's paper, and that was that when he wanted to claim that something was being used metaphorically, he found uh, intratextual evidence that it was a metaphor. Um, and well, that also raised another question. I was wondering, actually, just about Samuel, if if we're going to be able to find some internal yep. indication. Yep. yep. The man in the. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, my question is for Dr. Antony about. Uh, Israel being, uh, or God being racist because Israel is his chosen people. And it seems to be on the face of it counterintuitive when Abraham was promised to be uh, the vehicle by which God would bless all nations. And indeed in the present world we see that if Christianity is true, it's something which is burgeoning in many cultures around the world. Uh, in fact, it's probably basically an Asian religion. Uh, just like capitalism. Yes. Um, and so, <laughs> The, the question, I guess my question is, uh, if God has middle knowledge, then I don't think this is really a problem. At least it would make sense of it. You That's know, it, knowledge of counterfactuals? Yes. Okay. So, for instance, when um, in Acts 17, it said that God has set the exact times and places for all men, uh, such that each one may have the chance to come to know him, though he is not far from each one of us. And so it seems that if God has middle knowledge, then the racism charge just kind of drops out the window because it's not like God just had like, you know, all these people groups and he's just points or picks out of a hat or something like that and it's just an arbitrary selection. In the case of God as middle knowledge, that would explain uh, the salvation of all people and it wouldn't really matter that they would be part of this or that culture and that the racism would just drop out the window. Um. 
What you said doesn't address my moral concern about what happens. Um, God has chosen his people, and over and over and over again, he sacrifices the life, the liberty, the, the, the comfort, the, the everything of other people, other innocent people, for the sake of his chosen people. I'm sorry, that's, that's like, that's like an extensive definition of injustice. I mean, I just don't trust the, I'm sorry, I just don't trust the moral intuitions, the moral judgment of a person who says that isn't unjust. I mean, you know, all these innocent Egyptian, well, first of all, let's, you know, people talk about the innocent children. How about the innocent women? Women have no say in how, in how societies are organized or which gods are worshiped or how they're worshiped, right? They're all slaughtered too. So, you know, in, in Egypt, God wants his people to be let go, having, having engineered their being enslaved in the first place. And, uh, and then, as part of his strategy to get Pharaoh to let them go, except that when Pharaoh says they can go, God says, no, I'm not done yet, and hardens his heart, um, uh, he slaughters the firstborn children of the Egyptians. When David commits murder and adultery, um, God does punish him a little bit by killing his infant son. These are morally monstrous things, right? I'm sorry, I'm straying from the chosen, from the, from the chosen people aspect of it. The favoring of the Hebrew people over other people, whatever the, whatever the purpose is uh, of doing that, I think is unjust. And I actually am a little confused by the, the apologetic strategy that says if I can show that uh, God had a, had a morally laudable aim that any means whatsoever he chooses to employ to achieve it is okay. I, I, didn't, I wasn't brought up to think that the ends justified the means, but that's what people seem to say. So if, if your position is that it was okay for him to privilege um, the, the well-being of the Hebrews over the others. Okay, I'm sorry that I misunderstood. 